Hello and a very warm welcome back to the garden. It's the end of September and today as a garden tour we're going to do it a little bit differently. I'm actually going to go around and show you some of the key changes that are going to be happening and also the reasons why so you can get a flavour of what's going to happen over the coming months as winter draws in. I just wanted to show you not everything in this garden works out. I came today and saw that all of the sweet corn has been stripped by probably a vole or a mouse or something. So I was so excited, but I'm very gutted. Over the last few weeks, I've gotten quite interested with the potential that cover crops and green manures offer the, the health of the garden. I, I totally understand the principles behind it, so I've got to give it a go and see what happens. This bed here, we've got field beans, which are absolutely going for it, uh, interplanted with buckwheat that was broadcast sown, and it's, it's growing really quickly. So because it is growing really quickly, I'm going to have to make a decision over the next few weeks whether I just end up chopping it all down and letting it break down or trying to keep it going over winter and just see if any of the beans pull through next year. I spent a lot of time as a gardener thinking, why on earth am I going to grow a cover crop because I'm growing something that I'm not going to eat. But as time has progressed and as I now prioritise the soil because I understand the impact that that's going to have on the crops, I finally, I felt like I've, I've matured a bit in my attitude to that and that I can actually see the value of growing plants for the sake of improving the soil. And I'm, I'm really curious to see where this is going to take me. This is an interesting bed because I've kind of forgotten about it and it's a big prime bed. And partly it's because we've got a load of climbing berries that have started to take over and they're taking over soybeans, which I've never grown before. And I put them in really late, but we might just get something. I'm feeling the pods and I can feel the beans inside. That would be something interesting if it does work. But we, we've had a few uh, challenges here in terms of the beans and the beans being pulled out from the base by something. So my plan is to dry the beans as much as possible on the plant to save them as seed or I could cook them down and soak them and use them in, in soups and stews over winter. But this is all going to be nice and clear and I think I'm going to do a bit of a reset. We had outdoor cucumbers which did really well uh, but those need to come out. There's also the, the quinoa which is looking really good but I feel that just having a nice hard reset and a proper think over the next few weeks about what I want to do with this bed next year is going to be the best thing I can do for this area. Here are some Greek gigante beans I remember these seeds were kindly given to me from Lizorab because I, I always got so jealous of such massive beans. And because of the, the challenge of this year and it being so dry, the fruit set has probably not been optimal. So even though I'm going against the, the rules of seed saving, which is you need to save seed from the absolute best plants possible, I have faith that in, if I save the seeds from these, which I'm going to do, in a much more favourable climate, as in a much more favourable growing season, these will actually end up yielding loads. And then I'm going to keep it as my, my own seed stock in the same way that Liz is doing it. So there's going to be a lot of seeds here and it's a bit of fun and I just, I just love having massive beans like that. Uh, the other thing that's also massive is this Asturian, I always butcher the name, but I have to accept that, Asturian tree cabbage. Uh, this is now in its, in its second year, it's become mega and we might be able to use one of the stems as a walking stick. On the opposite end of the bed to the Greek Gigantes beans, we've got the carrots. This is just something that I sowed quite quickly just to see if I can squeeze in an extra crop. I've started to have a little investigation and pull them out and you can see that these tiny little roots are beginning to develop. And even though it's at the tail end of the season, I'm going to be utilising things like uh, this cold frame a lot more to help keep them nice and insulated. And I'm going to be using cold frames over winter and not just outside, but also in the polytunnel as double protection. You might not know it, but there are in fact seven ways 
to use a cold frame and there's a blog post down below so if you're interested to see what the seven ways of using a structure like this in the garden are that will give you the answers. Over the past I've had a bit of a love-hate relationship with cold frames and also mini greenhouses because I was frustrated with the low quality of them and when I founded HughesGarden.com and I was trying to pull the best gardening supplies together uh, to serve you guys as a community. I decided there wasn't actually a brand of cold frames and mini greenhouses that I wanted to carry because I didn't feel that they were up to the right standard. And so I thought to myself, why not just create my own? So I spent almost a year designing, sourcing and developing what I think are the best lightweight cold frames and mini greenhouses out there. No joke, we went on a bit of a global search to find a manufacturer who'd be able to make them and I had a lot of issues, but finally we found a great partner over in the US who specialise in handmade wooden cedar wood products. They were really on board with the idea and so we've worked together to produce six different products that are housed in the US and the UK and so far the feedback has been really really positive. The cedar wood that we use is highly durable. Firstly it's naturally rot and insect resistant. Cedar wood in fact is one of the best woods in the world suited for outdoor use in a wet climate. For example usually here or if you're in a garden and you're doing a lot of irrigation. In addition to the cedar woods we've gone for a really simple design of using a high quality uh, twin walled polycarbonate sheet. Because of its thickness it's really nice and durable which means that you can use the products outside and they're going to survive the winter. So all in all I don't think there's anything available to gardeners at this level. When I first started making these videos about 11 years ago at the age of 12, I would never have dreamed that I'd start creating my own line of gardening products, but I'm grateful for all of your support of making this possible. And so if you are looking for any kind of cold frame or mini greenhouse that comes with a seven year anti rot guarantee, which I think is very fair, you can find them over at HughesGarden.com. It's designed by a gardener for gardeners. You wouldn't believe it, but it took me around 10 years to realise I don't need a huge amount of kale because it is so productive. I think on average I'd get a bit carried away and end up with the equivalent of two full raised beds of kale moving into every single winter and that is just that's just excessive over the top. I'd much rather scale back on the kale well that, that works I'll scale back on the kale and open up more space uh, to grow garlic for example which is one of the things that I can always do with more of. But the kale that is here is lovely and healthy and luscious and, and the colour of the leaves with this kind of the dew of the morning has just, oh, it just looks so stunning. Uh, in terms of the aesthetics it really does add to a winter garden but I don't need a huge amount because it is such a wonderfully productive crop. And I'm smiling through the pain because it's yet another outdoor sweet corn crop that has been destroyed. I, I, I said to Sam, who's behind the camera filming at the moment, I said, you know what, all's not lost because I can put it on the compost. And I know that that's, it is lost, uh, but at least the rest of the plant and the detritus on the, on the base, which looks like quite a nice mulch actually. So the, the mice did a, a really nice tidy job to mulch. Um, but this is just gonna be cut down right at the base put on the compost, bulk that up a bit, that's absolutely okay. We've got some radish that is coming through nicely, some pak choy. I've really quickly grown, absolutely love and adore this crop. It grows so quickly, uh, it's so nice to enjoy. It's a really nice texture, even though it's a leafy green, the texture makes it so nice and appetizing. And it's, it's gonna be one of, in a future video where I talk about some underrated crops for self-sufficiency, pak choy is gonna be a feature of that. So this will also be out in about a month because it grows so quickly and I'm probably going to just cover crop it and think about how I want to use it for next year. Perhaps I do put a load of garlic in, but on the theme of garlic behind me at the end of the bed, there's Chinese garlic chives which have started flowering and they're so beautiful. We spent a bit of the time thinking that they're not going to come through or make it, but they ended up picking up pace at the end of the season and 
Uh, as a perennial, they should come back every year. And I really hope that they do come back every year because they are an amazing crop. If you have beds in the garden, you'll instinctively know which of the higher performing beds and which beds are perhaps lacking in terms of the soil health and nutrition. And this is one of the beds that I'd happily admit is in the lacking category. Perhaps part of that, thinking about it as permaculture, is the furthest away from the gate. Uh, so I need to rethink the strategy for this bed. Right now what I have done is I've got some mangle beets and some beetroot, which are doing well and they can do really well in, in low quality soils, as well as some lettuce that is enjoying it. I've sown some phacelia, which is a high biomass cover crop that I'm going to terminate by cutting at the base and letting it break down. And again, because of the stillness and how slow this time of year is, I've now got the time to look at all of the things that haven't quite worked in the garden or things that are perhaps holding back its potential to come up with an action plan over autumn and winter. I've got months to do it, but I'm gonna prioritize doing it because before you know it, March is gonna be here again. And yeah, I, I know as much as you do about what's gonna to happen to this bed next year, which is zero. This is the other bed that I'm not super happy with its health, that's okay. As a gardener, we have the control to, to change that. You can actually see a perfect example there with the leeks. The leeks should be much bigger. They were put in a while ago, but leeks are, are quite a hungry crop and they've, they've run out of steam and that's a really good indicator that there is something lacking in this and I haven't given the attention that it needs. There are some things that are absolutely okay with this. For example, kohlrabi, turnips and uh, more kohlrabi here. Also, just a little tip, a little aside that I've, I've noticed at our other garden at Dan Ronen. Side by side, the, the purple pak choy suffered less pest damage compared to a green pak choy. And I wonder why, but I thought that that was quite an interesting realization. To try and combat the lower soil fertility, we sowed some buckwheat, but even that was like, no, I'm only gonna send up a few plants. So there's gonna be some drastic action here, obviously not digging in, in stuff. And so really moving forward, because beds split up the garden so nicely, I'm thinking about what is, what is a role that I can give to each bed that's going to contribute to the whole garden? How can each bed play to its strength? A real highlight of this season has been how the celery didn't bolt with the drought. And there's a lot here, and I reckon, and I, I reckon uh, if I can uh, convince Sam enough to help me make a massive uh, batch of stock uh, with, with this celery, that would be really useful. You use celery in stock, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Then there's the, the massive mangled beets uh, inspired by Stephanie Hafty, and I'm also inspired by her to turn them into wine. Uh, then there's some winter radish at the top, some perpetual spinach. It's feeling really lush and green. I'm really happy with it. And then just chucked in some extra winter salads. But I think because of the proximity of where this is, this could be a potential place at the bottom here to put in some of October's garlic sowing, perhaps intercropped along the, the rows between everything else that is planted here. But overall, I'm really happy with, with how this bed has performed. In front of me here is spring cabbage. So it's a greenhound cabbage because one of the, the best types of green cabbages for spring cabbage are the pointy varieties. And I, I love greyhound. It's such a solid, really easily accessible variety. There's also amaranth here, which is, it's like, I mean, it's just a funny plant, isn't it? but it looks so striking. But starting from here above the, the cabbage and once the ochre is harvested, this whole bed is gonna be clear. It's gonna be a blank canvas and this is quite a nice central bed. So my, my thoughts and my feelings actually, because of how nice it's been with the borage and some of the marigolds is to have this perhaps be a nice edible flower bed because it's nice, it's like a central island to the garden and I think it would be a really nice feature next year. This bed has been a vertical bed 
over this season. So as well as having the beautiful leek flowers, we've got the runner beans and the sweet corn, which I don't want to talk about too much. So everything from this, the, the beetroot has been really productive as well, but all of this will be clear. Perhaps I'll sacrifice this kohlrabi uh, for a month's time. This is gonna be completely clear and open. And I think that this would be a nice prime spot for putting in a load of garlic. These two beds have been nice and productive. Uh, these leeks are looking lovely. The, the colour of the leeks, it almost reminds me of the, the vividness of the, of the, the kale down there. Um, these sunflowers, have, chocolate sunflowers, have served us well, but it's coming to the end of that. And I think the saddest part for me around this time of year is that you start losing all of the vertical structures of the garden, be it the wigwams, the A-frames, the trellises, these, the sweet corn, these are all going to be out in a month. And then suddenly the garden just is flat. And that's okay. <laughs> it makes you look forward to it. Uh, but it's, it does help enclose the garden nicely. And we're going to lose that. And that's okay because I do, I do, it's a weird thing. I, li I like the change in the garden. Um, the Asturian tree cabbage there, uh, the, the second generation is looking really nice. I'm going to keep that going as much as possible next year to help gain the, the exact same height as before. Um, we've got some, just a bit of buckwheat in there. The golden beetroot in the front has done absolutely amazing. So tasty. And this is also next year's purple sprouting broccoli. But the real hero, which is hidden from your view right now, for me, has been this amazing pink flowering buckwheat. Just something to look at and for the pollinators. And it's just, it's just kept on going. You could go back two or three garden tours and it'll probably still be flowering back then. It should only be flying for about four or six weeks, but it seems to really love it here. So I'm very grateful for that color. This is a bit of a game of uh, spot the bed. Uh, I'm going to be talking about three beds here. There's obviously the Vigo garden bed, which yeah, you can get from our shop. Uh, there's this bed here and the bed in front of me. This has been swamped right now by this sylvanberry, which is an absolute, it's a lovely, lovely uh, soft root, a climbing berry, trailing berry, but it always takes over. And so, the goal for the next few weeks is just to tame it back because this is a new growth. So this is going to yield the fruit uh, for next year. And so we've got to tame it back, fan train it back onto the trellis, open up this space, and then this bed will be back in action, ready for next year. This, the, the bed to the left of me has been a really nice bed. I, st I had a load of spare ochre that I've put in and the, the texture of the ochre leaves looks is so beautiful um, when you contrast it to the beetroot and also to the nasturtiums, which was a case of, I'm just going to put a little plant on the corner and hope it spreads out onto the path. And I've just let it take over about a third of the bed, uh, but it's, it's nice and full. These three beds have been nice and full and really productive. Right at the bottom though, was a bit of a challenge. It's Ford Hook Giant Chard, and the clue's in the name. It's meant to be giant, but it's smaller than the usual chard that I that I grow, and I think that's because of just how dry it is. Over the last couple of weeks, though, it's had a new lease of life, so I'm excited to see if maybe it comes comes uh, raving back and gives us a nice surprise. So it turns out I've apparently been missing a bit of a trick with the asparagus and a common companion planting is strawberries underneath the asparagus. So I already know next year I'm going to give that a go. I'm going to plant strawberries around the edges and along the middle of this asparagus and I'm going to see what happens. Whilst this asparagus though has been up, it's created a nice amount of space and light underneath, which has allowed me though to succession plant some more annuals instead to enjoy at the tail end of the season. We've got a lovely pumpkin in here, for example, but also uh, just behind me, um, I'm growing uh, a bunch of radish. And you can see how successful that radish has been. All we've been doing uh, to this bed though is adding is adding loads of kind of composted wood chip. So you can see that that's having a, a really nice effect. But the, th the thing that's so nice 
and you probably see it right now with this asparagus, is when there's, uh, there's moisture on it and the droplets, it just shines. Uh, it reminds me of, you know, like a disco ball. It's like the garden's version of, of a disco ball. A lot of you know that I like to start brassicas off in a seed bed and then transplant them, especially stemmed brassicas, for example, kale and purple sprouts and broccoli, Brussels sprouts. These, this is the remnants of what didn't get transplanted. And I've actually, I decided to leave them in and see what happens. And it's a brassica polyculture that is looking really nice and I'm gonna, we're just gonna see what it is. I'm gonna just keep on harvesting up until around March, where we'll just cut it down. And I'll probably end up using it as a brassica seed bed then for a third year in the row. It's currently in the second, but I like the position a bit out of the way. And that is the plan. This is, this is the dedicated space. One of the, the things though, it's kind of gone over, but globe artichokes with the flowers, it is just a stunning vegetable. These two beds are very perennial focused. However, I want to draw your attention to this self-sown amaranth uh, amongst the strawberries, which it's just absolutely loved it here. So I'm very happy with that. So we've got the strawberries, we've got the compost pathway. And I, I finally, I finally remembered when I was not at the garden to look up at what this plant is, where so many of you have answered, uh, have asked. And I, I bring you good news that I know what it is. It's a type of perennial Dock. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I now need to try it and to eat it, but it looks amazing. It is apparently an edible perennial. I think a lot of edible perennials are overrated. And I'm going to have to maybe claim part of this bed back to grow some more flavoursome crops. But this is great fun. It's kind of become a bit of a character of the garden. And now we all know what it is. <laughs> We've now come right to the top end of the garden. And before I talk about a little bit of an open space there, which will be quite exciting, wanted to just showcase direct sowing. Uh, I, even though I love module sowing, there is something so special about direct sowing and the plants just having the space to develop a really strong root system from, from the outgo. This is a, a mix of a load of different uh, ornamental greens such as Mitsuna, Tatsoi, for example, uh, but then also everything else, for example, mustards. Uh, and this is, if you want to get a nice, quick, diverse salad, this is the bed to come to. Uh, and then also here, the leeks are looking really nice. A lot of these areas have actually had coffee grounds in, and I, I can't actually see any difference where there was a big mulch of coffee grounds or not. Uh, I don't know what we can take from that, but what I am going to be taking from that is a lot of leaks over winter. This corner is often the just the dumping corner. So just put something out of the way and don't film it. And I think the reason why is because there isn't enough of a reason to film here and it's a useful bit of space. But I'm going to change that now because this space here, we're going to put a hotbed and I'll be talking a lot more about hotbeds on this channel over the, the coming years in fact. But this area is suddenly going to become a lot more popular again, hopefully, in the videos. A few of you have been wondering about my, my winter potatoes that I started off uh, on that video that has nearly had a million views now about starting and growing potatoes in containers. Well, here they are. Uh, the useful thing about this time of year is you can just stack them up and then we're going to be harvesting these starting around late October, early November. So the biggest opportunity right now for us gardeners is to make as much compost as possible, uh, which is what these sweet corn are going to turn into. Uh, I'm using, as an ambassador for Gardena, I get to try lots of different things. This is one of my favourites. It's, it's a shear that allows you uh, to get actually really big stems and cut them down like it's nothing. So uh, if you're struggling though, if you're 
all of this green material that is coming out of the garden, for example, the sweet corn, and you're struggling to add maybe a, a diversity of material or some browns, this video right here, which I'm using as well to cover the carnage and the upsetting story of this sweet corn, and I'm cutting it down now so I never have to think about it again, will give you a load of ideas to bulk up your compost bins to help you become more self-sufficient in compost.